John Singenthal, let me tell you, I have known him from the early days of the civil rights involvement when I became involved in civil rights back in 1961. It is quite fortunate that we had the eyes, the ears, and the mind, and the guidance, and the advice from people in the office of the Attorney General of the United States. John Siegenthal was one of those, and hear more about that in just a little bit. But I want you to know, had it not been for the support of the Kennedy family then, the Kennedy family, I'm talking about Jack, the President, and Bobby, the Attorney General, we would not have been able to do the things that we did Notwithstanding the fact that there were people like John Siegenthaler who were sent there to say, you crazy kids, you got to stop doing what you're doing. And he carried the message back, well, you know, I can't tell those kids what to do. <laughs> they, they, own, they own their own. They own self powered And that's what caught me up in the movement itself. I did not go down to Albany, Georgia to become a civil rights activist, and I couldn't even spell it, I don't think. I never heard of it. But it was the students. It was the students. They were down there going to jail, demonstrating, trying to get people registered to vote. That's what inspired me. So John Sagenthaler implanted himself right in the midst of the movement. You got me? He didn't stand on the outside and criticize. He came on the inside to criticize. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously. He came and joined in with the Freedom Riders. He came in and became a part of them. That gave him a perspective that you could not possibly get by just reading about it in the papers. Right. You can't get it. He got it. He talked to those who were getting on those buses and getting on those trains, subjected to being all kinds of terrible treatment. He was there. Mm -hmm. He's a writer. He's an author. He's a publisher. He's a teacher. As a matter of fact, he's one of the few people living that I know of that has a bridge named after him. Is that in the bridge? <laughs> well, he saved a man from, from jumping to his death from a bridge. Didn't they name their bridge after him? Well, anyway, he also is a humanitarian. And he does things out of love for people, his love for justice. Now, he's an editor. He has been identified with USA Today, the Tennessean, he was a part of the Society of Newspaper Editors. He's been at Vanderbilt, and if any of you ever go to Nashville, Tennessee, make sure you go by Vanderbilt University, where you will find a building with his name. It's dedicated to the men for what he did for civil rights. That's what makes me proud to identify him as a friend of mine. And, in, and, and, and I'm certainly proud to be able to present him to you so without saying anything further, let me present to you John Sigenthaler. John. Well, that's some introduction. Um, I, I deeply appreciate it, my friend. Um, you know, I'm I'm, uh, I'm so happy to be a dean. I've had a great day. I have uh, seen a place I never visited before. Um, and I mean, I have seen all of it. Um, <laughs> and I've loved it. I've been treated uh, so kindly, so hospitably, so warmly. and. Uh, my coming here uh, is something uh, that I'll take home with me uh, to Nashville and, uh, and remember. My friend Bill mentioned the fact that they've named a bridge for me. The mayor uh, told me that a couple of weeks ago. And, um, I have a grandson who's uh, 15 years old, Jack Sigenthaler lives in Connecticut with my son, <coughs> a television anchor. And um, a few nights ago, Jack, he calls periodically to uh, check on my conduct. <coughs> and called a few, a few nights ago and said, uh, Grand, uh, I hear they're naming a bridge for us. 
And I said, that's right, Jack. And, uh, you know, um, called last night on my cell phone, said, where are you? And I told him I was here in Lansing, Michigan. I said, well, what are you going to do tomorrow? And I said, well, tomorrow I'm, I'm going to spend the day uh, talking about civil rights. I'll be with my friend Bill Anderson, and, uh, and there's a wonderful audience I'm going to address late in the afternoon, early evening. And he said, Grant, tell me, what is the first thing you'll say to that, that audience? And I said, well, Jack, of course, I'll tell them I'm so happy to be with them. And Jack says, Grand, you are 86 years old. You're happy to be anywhere. <laughs> And you know, Jack's right. <clears throat> but I'm particularly honored and happy and pleased to be part of this lecture series here at Michigan State. Pleased to have been asked by my friend, Bill. As you must know, if you know anything about him, uh, it is so fitting that this lecture series is to be named for him. Um, his presence reminds us that journey from slavery to freedom is not complete. He was in an earlier life the leader of what was called, as you know, probably, the Albany Movement. He suffered persecution prosecution, condemnation, castigation, professionally and personally. He was described as an insurrectionist because he headed that initiative designed to change the intolerance and violence, part of the character and culture of his native region and mine. We were both born and reared. Uh, into this culture. Um, you've heard briefly uh, in that generous introduction, words identifying my own involvement in the civil rights struggle, largely during my time um, as assistant, administrative assistant to Attorney General Robert Kennedy. But I want you to understand as I discuss my own relationship to this historic journey from slavery to freedom, that I am a white native son of the racist South, reared in that culture, witness to the hatred that haunted our Jim Crow lynch law society. Childhood and young adulthood of my generation was smothered by the blatant lie of white superiority, virtually suffocated by the falsehood that black people were inherently, somehow, by nature, inferior, and therefore undeserving of equal treatment under law. I say that and you say, how could we ever have believed it? How could I and my white childhood classmates and friends, not have been infected and negatively affected during much of my youth and young adulthood by the virus of invidious discrimination that was part of that region's systematic rejection of any concept of, equal, of equality or equal justice on the law. It was it was part of the region's system of white education, both public and private. You know, memories fade, and we're prone to forget uh, memories that are uncomfortable or unpleasant. And I apologize if I look back and address some of those memories from a personal perspective tonight. I, I was a witness, I was a witness 
to the Nashville movement as a journalist. You know, today I think too often we seek to put the past behind us, to bury it, to say we must protect those, particularly those who are young, from exposure to that senseless time of tragic racism. But those who lived it and suffered from it, and yes, those who survived the apex of it 50 years ago, know if they think seriously about it that we forget harsh facts of that second American Revolution called the Civil Rights Movement. We forget it at our peril. The challenge a half century later is to help those who did not live it come to understand it. And so, as I say, I hope you will forgive me if these remarks seem to dwell on my own personal journey. And that journey for me, for you, for the nation is not complete and we delude ourselves if we think it is. It is far too simple to say, far too naive to believe that because Barack and Michelle Obama and their two beautiful daughters sleep tonight at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in our nation's capital, that we have buried the past, put it behind us forever and for the better. The chief reason that months ago I immediately accepted the invitation by Bill to come here today is because this forum offers, offers once more the opportunity to, to revisit that time when the laws of my native region and his were grounded in racial intolerance that actually encouraged, tolerated venomous violence, visited on those who were blind. It's wrong to turn our backs on that elongated, ruthless period, on the theory that it's a piece of the ugly past best forgotten. Wrong, I think, not to welcome every opportunity to revisit the heroism of those, many of them children, students who marched and demonstrated and confronted insult, assault, jail, often threats to their lives and some who lost their lives, to change the vulgar, vicious system that ruled their lives, indeed all of our lives in the South. Wrong to think, best not to ruminate on the murder of Martin in Memphis. Best not to ruminate on the murder of Medgar in Mississippi. Best not to dwell on the 40 members of the movement who gave their lives to end that reign of racist reality. So let me tonight ask each of you, in your own mind's eye, to reflect on a time in my city, Nashville, Tennessee, very much like every city of the South. Reflect in your own mind's eye and consider if you were black, a time where anywhere you needed to go or wanted to go, a hospital, a hotel or motel if you're traveling, a restaurant, a lunch counter, you could not go. You could not go simply because of the coloration of your skin and there were ordinances and statutes and a federal Supreme Court decision style Plessy versus Ferguson that said you could be prosecuted and jailed or fined if you did go. And beyond that, there were the damnable signs everywhere, everywhere that told you where you could not go, where you should go. Try to put yourself in the place of one of those young black college students in my hometown at Fisk or Tennessee State or American Baptist Seminary. In class, you hear from the lectern 
and read from the textbooks the words of Jefferson about all of us being equal, the words of Madison about equal justice under law. And then you look around in that southern city and you see no semblance of equality or even-handed justice. On weekends, you and perhaps a couple of classmates go downtown to look around the town where your school is located, perhaps to a movie, perhaps to do a little shopping, have lunch, take a bus ride back to the campus. You purchase your ticket for the movie. The only entrance is down an alley and up two narrow flights of stairs to a second balcony where you are forced to stay during the course of that movie. Afterward, you would visit the department store where you're allowed to purchase anything you have the money to buy except you may not sit at the lunch counter or into that restaurant for a lunch or a sandwich. And on the bus ride back to campus, you pay your fare, but then you must seat yourself in the back of the bus, in the back of the trolley, as those damnable signs direct. It was this experience for those young black students I observed as a journalist in my hometown that created something called the Nashville Movement, which produced there and elsewhere the nonviolent sit-ins. Again, in your mind's eye, put yourself in the place of one of those students. And one day you hear that at a nearby church, Clark Memorial, just off the Fisk campus, there is a black ministerial student, um, a student at Vanderbilt, one of two who have been admitted to the uh, Divinity School. And he has started a series of weekless, weekly uh, lectures. His name is Jim Lawson. And these workshops are focusing on the power of nonviolence as a method of bringing about social change. Jim Lawson, you learn, you hear from your friends, you ask about him. He had worked in India. He was a student, um, a student of Gandhian nonviolence. That Gandhian nonviolence that had transformed a colonial country. Colonial country. You learn that this James Lawson has spent a year in prison as a conscientious objector, refusing to serve in the military in the early days of the Vietnam War because he's a committed pacifist. There are rumors that these workshops are to lead to direct action to challenge the policy of segregation that so dominate life throughout the city, throughout the South. And from these workshops, you decide to attend flow the Nashville sit-ins that result in massive arrests, your own included, incarceration of you, hundreds of other black students. You know, it's, um, it's soon that similar actions, and one in Greensboro had occurred just before your own sit-in movement began. Um, but soon there are similar actions in other cities across the South. Think back on the times I witnessed as a young journalist, and today I still marvel and wonder where it came from, that courage of those young people sat in and were willing to confront, were willing to confront vicious threats, willing to defy convention, defy the law, defy hostile police, defy the wrath of a visible Ku Klux Klan in that town. The courage 
to defy the dislike of most in the discomfited white community. These students joined the Nashville movement led by Jim Lawson knowing because he made it clear that violence and incarceration would be what they would face. But they joined despite the strong objections of some of their teachers and virtually all of their parents. Parents who loved them, who worried that their arrest, their incarceration, would be indelible marks on their records that would turn employers against them for decades. If there were arrest records their parents warned, never would they be able to be teachers or lawyers or doctors or preachers. These arrest records would haunt their searches for jobs throughout their careers, their parents feared. And still, they found the courage, and I wonder today where it came from, to join that movement. They believed Jim Lawson. They believed nonviolence could change the social order. Now I think for a moment about the town at large. White business leadership never had it been challenged in just this way before. There was no way to reach or influence these students. Well, there was one way. They could go for the mentor, and they went for Jim Lawson. And they had him expelled from Vanderbilt Divinity School because he was the mentor of that movement. He was close to Martin King, and Dr. King arranged that same year for him to be enrolled in Boston at Boston University, and, and he graduated, uh, received his divinity degree that, that year. Um, think for a minute about that leadership, that white business leadership never bore so, before so challenged. You know, they're thinking, if we can just sweat this out, if we can just put up with this, we can't stop it. Um, Lawson's expelled, but he's still here. And they're still here, and we can't stop it. But you know, if we can just sweat it out to May. School's out, they'll all go home. The momentum will be gone. They'll never start this movement again if we can just outlast this threat to a Pacific community life. Well, Lawson and the leaders of the movement in Nashville, with the support of Dr. King, were thinking too. And so it was in the spring, as Easter approached, that the Nashville movement initiated a boycott on all downtown business. By this time, the total black community and small segments of the white community had begun to rally behind the student movement. And this pre-Easter this pre boycott was so highly effective. I think back, I think back on the movement I'm reminded how often those who resorted to violence, in fact, triggered a result that propelled the movement forward. And there came a time in my community when the white community was looking for a way to end this disruption that the sit-ins had caused. And there was a bomb planted at the home of a great black lawyer member of the city council, Z. Alexander Luby. They blew his house off its foundation. He and his wife were hospitalized but not seriously injured. I remember reporting on it 
by dawn, the students, again, imagine yourself one of them. By dawn, they had planned a massive, what they called silent march downtown to City Hall where they confronted Mayor Ben West. You know, it was the day before cell phones and they sent the mayor a telegram to tell him he was coming. And, and he came out to meet them. And you know, they were so well planned and the demonstrations were so well orchestrated. And, and C.T. Vivian, uh, now a distinguished uh, minister in Atlanta, Cordy Vivian challenged Mayor Ben West, said, during these sit-ins, your police force has been brutal. Your administration has been insensitive. And, and West, I mean, I was standing there that day and watched uh, watch the anger slowly rise, and he was very self-defensive, and he said, you know, I don't own these stores, and, uh, you know, the lunch counter at the airport, that's where the only place I have any influence, and that, we desegregated that, and Vivian said, no, 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 Mayor, don't misrepresent it. You know, uh, first of all, if we're going to go to the airport, we're going to fly. We don't go out there for lunch. But they desegregated the airport because the federal government made them do it. There came a moment in this tense confrontation between Cordy Vivian and Ben West in which a beautiful young Fisk Jr. named Diane Nash, um, Bill has brought her here, she stepped forward soft voice, not challenging him, but confronting him with a direct question, Mr. Mayor, is it really morally right, do you think it's morally right for the owners of these stores to welcome us, to sell us anything money can buy but a hamburger? Is it morally right? There is a video in which she and Ben West reenact this confrontation. And you can see on the mayor's face, first consternation, he's still angry uh, from those challenges that had come from Reverend Vivian. But now he's confronting this beautiful young, world, young girl who has hit him hard with a question that ch challenged morality. And he answered with an honest question, no, it's not morally right. He said, you know, I don't own the stores and can't control them, but I can tell you I know it's not morally right. And that statement served to move our community's power structure toward the inevitable. And within weeks, desegregation was reality. And the city was transformed for the first time and partially. Following year, the students launched a series of stand-ins at those downtown movie houses, and in short order, the segregated second, second balconies were history. And then in, within a few weeks, as this same phenomenon of sit-ins spread across the South, then within a few weeks, there was word that James Farmer and the Congress of Crazy Equality had set out on something called the Freedom Rides. The plan was for core members to integrate Greyhound and Trailways buses originating in Baltimore and Washington and to travel throughout the South at each terminal testing segregation policies at lunch counters and restrooms. The rides had New Orleans as their final destination. They proceeded with several stops resulting in threats and attacks. And I know much of this history is familiar of you, uh, to many of you who've read about the movement. Um, it's vital to understand uh, and to remember if you knew 
There came a Sunday afternoon when one of the buses was confronted by a, a Klan roadblock, roadblock in Anniston, Alabama. The Freedom Riders were mauled, beaten brutally, some knocked unconscious. This bus was bombed and burned. Some had trouble escaping, suffered smoke inhalation. The next day, those Freedom Riders, that first wave, some still hospitalized from wounds and smoke inhalation, voted among themselves to end the Freedom Rides. They were dead. It was over. It had ended. The white community thought. The following night, the Nashville students met at downtown First Baptist Church, decided they could not let violence in, Al in Alabama overcome nonviolence. And they voted among themselves to travel to Birmingham, take up the rides from Montgomery, from Birmingham to Montgomery, to Jackson, to New Orleans. But this time I had left journalism and was working as Robert Kennedy's administrative assistant in the Justice Department. Word came to us of the brutality that had confronted those first, that first wave of freedom riders. They were trapped. They had voted not to continue the rides. They determined that the only way to get to their destination, New Orleans, was by air. And that morning there were two bomb threats at the airport where they gathered. And calls came to the Justice Department and the Attorney General asked me to join him and we went to the White House and met with the President. And we decided that I would fly to Birmingham, meet with the officials of the Eastern and Delta Airlines and get those Freedom Riders by air to their destination. And, and that was pretty simple. By nightfall, we were there. I went to sleep thinking I had done what the President and the Attorney General wanted. And I really thought I was, you know, sort of the unsung hero of the Kennedy administration at that point. <laughs> And uh, I went to bed at the, mot at the hotel, motel, the hotel at the, uh, well, the motel at the uh, airport. Five o'clock, the call came. And it's Bobby. Who the hell is Diane Nash? She asked. I said, well, Bob, she's a young student, I think a junior at Fisk University. She was active in the sit-ins. I thought you would know her because she's from your hometown. Please call her. Tell her what you have seen. Tell her how this first wave of Freedom Riders almost lost their lives, how brutalized they were. Tell her not to send another wave of Freedom Riders into Alabama en route to New Orleans. And so I called her. Some of you may have seen the documentary done on the Freedom Rides. And if you have, um, you've heard me recount my conversation <laughs> on the telephone that morning with Diane Nash. I think back on it, and, and, and the thing I most remember is how calm and collected and committed she was. 
And how her calmness <laughs> moved me. Well, over the next 10 minutes, I can, I, I can remember that conversation. I, I think about it, and I can hear my voice go up a decibel, and up a decibel, and up a decibel, and up a decibel. And finally, I'm saying at the top of my voice, young woman, do you not understand you're going to get somebody killed if these kids come down here? Her voice is not raised a decibel. And she said, sir, you don't understand. They all signed their last wills last night. You tell me someone may die. We know someone may die. But they're on the way. And by the time I got back to Birmingham, Bull Connor had them incarcerated in jail. Um, you know, I think back, I think back on that time, those young people in the Nashville movement, and those in other movements, including the Albany movement. I wonder where that courage came from. The courage to risk life nonviolently, committed not to fight back in order to change the society. Um, <clears throat> you know, here we are, half century later and more, wondering whether the journey from slavery to freedom has been completed. You must know it has not. And let me tell you why I make that assertion. It was only a couple of years ago that petitions were filed in my state with what's called the Board of Regents. And the Board of Regents was asked by petition to grant honorary degrees to 14 freedom riders who were expelled from Tennessee State University after their arrest and conviction for disturbing the peace at Jackson, Mississippi. They had not disturbed the free peace. Um, they simply had bought tickets and rode the bus and sat where they pleased. When they crossed into the Mississippi, uh, across the Mississippi line, the bus was stopped. They were arrested, convicted, sent to Parchman Prison, the hellhole of American prisons. And as I say, the 14 from Tennessee State were expelled. And a couple of years ago, the Board of Regents was asked to give them honorary degrees. And the board, at first, by a vote of 11 to 4, refused. Refused without explanation, except to say it might demean the quality of the honorary degree. Thankfully, massive protests followed most from the school's alumni, but others from all over the country. And soon there was a telephone vote, a second vote, by which the Board of Regents reversed themselves and voted unanimously to grant those honorary degrees. But can you imagine that almost 50 years after those students risked their lives, risked jail, suffered incarceration in that hellhole parchment prison. A board in an enlightened state would take that position against them and only under duress would, revert the, would, would reverse itself to grant those honorary degrees. It's hard thinking back on it how those students endured what they did. And more difficult still, to think how 
body of politicians could all those years later turn their back on them. I'll just make one more point visiting the past. I, make, tell, I relate one more event from the past to make the point that the journey is not, is not complete. And most of you know this story, I know about it. It involves a young boy, 14 years old. He lives in Chicago with his mother. His name is Emmett Till. His mother is Mamie Till Mobley. Summertime, she sends Emmett south to Money, Mississippi to visit his uncle. And you know, he was a handsome 14 year old lad, and met pals and was collegial and friendly with them. And one day they're in front of a country store operated by a white woman. That night she tells her husband and brother that this young visitor from Chicago had insulted her. It's not clear what he said or if he said anything. Some say it was a wolf whistle. Those two men went to the home of Emmett Till's uncle and kidnapped him. They beat him brutally. They disfigured him. They shot him through the head. They tied his body uh, to a discarded automotive radiator threw his body into the river. Mamie Till brought her boy home to Chicago and opened the doors to the media. You know, John Lewis has said the media to the movement was like wings to a bird. And he would know. When Mamie Till Mobley invited Jet and Ebony Magazine to come in and photograph Emmett, the whole world saw those pictures. They were picked up from Johnson Publications and spread all across the country by the wire services. And I tell you that story from the past. And we would all hope, you know, it'll never happen again. We would all believe it might never happen again. But you know, I've thought about Mamie Till Mobley, who came to the Siegenthaler Center at Vanderbilt um, a few years ago and related her story. But I tell it because I think of her and I've thought of her twice during these last few months. The first time was the, the outcome of the trial of George Zimmerman who confronted, then shot and killed, Trayvon Martin, who was 17, in a neighborhood near Miami Gardens, Florida. Emmett Till was wearing a hood. He was black, and he was suspect. And he was murdered. And you know the outcome of that. George Zimmerman is free. And then more recently in Jacksonville, we watched as a white man named Michael Dunn was tried for killing another 17-year-old black lad, Jordan Davis, after a controversy erupted over Dunn's objection to the victim and his friends listening to what Dunn called loud music. Well, Dunn shot into this car 
kill this land and will serve a long term for firing those shots. But the jury, as in the Zimmerman trial, did not convict him of murder. I could not help but think, as I watched the mothers of these two black, these two young black men, 17 years old, mourn the loss of their sons, I could not help but think of Mamie Till and her son in it. You can tell me that there are aspects of the cases of the past and the cases of the present that should be considered, and I won't disagree, but I will answer that the tears of the mothers of Traver, Trayvon and Jordan were as real as the tears of Mamie Till Mowgli. You know, um, I think of the experiences like these, Board of Regents in Tennessee, two juries in Florida, and I know the journey from slavery to freedmen has not ended. These lectures are important. They're important because they force us to face the past we'd rather not face. So I come to Michigan State to say with my friend Bill Anderson that we must not assume that the journey is complete. I said throughout this day to those who are young that the challenge now is for them. Young people their age changed this society once and they these young people must change it once more. I want to close with another story about Jack, my beloved grandson. When he was five years old, he lived in Connecticut with his parents and periodically we would visit. And so one Thanksgiving, we were there. Always it was my job to read Jack a couple of stories at bedtime. And so there I am snuggled in with this five-year-old, his father, six foot two, stern, walks in, dad, long day today, Long day tomorrow, it's Thanksgiving. Read one story to Jack tonight, only one story. Jack, you got it? Grand's gonna read one story tonight. Yes, Dad, yes, son. He goes, okay, Jack, what it'll be? Well, I'd like a chapter of Harry Potter, this one. And I read it, and I finish it. Begin to lean down to kiss him. He says, wait, Grand. Dad said you could read me a story. But you know, you could tell me another story. <laughs> I said, okay, fine, Jack, I will. But it'll have to be a short story. You have anything you'd like me to tell you? He said, yeah, Grant. Not long ago, Mom and Dad and I watched a documentary on television. And there was a guy there, an actor, who had your name. Big fat guy, bald headed, but he was you. And uh, you know, he got hurt. And um, it was during the Freedom Rides. Tell me about that. Well, I said, Jack, it'll have to be quick, or your father will be in here on both of us. But the story is a short story. There came a time, Jack. One day in Montgomery, Alabama, when some mean, angry, hostile white people would not let black people ride the bus. But the black people insisted on riding the bus. 
And these mean, angry, hostile white people beat them, put them in the hospital. And one of them beat me and put me in the hospital. But Jack, it's a story with a happy ending. We all came out of the hospital. We survived it. And now we can all ride the bus. You know, you tell your, this beautiful five-year-old child, that story, and you look into that innocent face, you know that somewhere wheels are turning. I don't know whether it was 10 seconds or 30 seconds or a minute or two. When it came, Grand, are you black? <laughs> you know, look at this beautiful child. I've been to preschool with him. There are two black children in that class. And I suddenly realize I'm talking to a child who's colorblind. I'm talking to a child who is colorblind. And I kissed him. I said, it really doesn't matter, does it, Jack? And I went home. And I thought about it. I sat down at the computer one day and I wrote him a letter. I recounted the story just as I've told it to you. And I said to him, you know, Jack, I told you something's not true. I said it didn't matter. Race matters. Color still matters. I can only hope, Jack. I'm 75, you're five. That was 11 years ago. I can only hope, Jack, that by the time you're 75, color won't matter anymore. My friends, color still matters. The problems of the past linger. The journey from slavery to freedom is not complete. There's hope. I sat with students all day today. I know there's hope. I see my grandson and his generation colorblind. I know there's hope. I come to this place, to this lecture series, where you have come to revisit the past, to relive it, determined not to forget it. You know, we're with each passing year, perhaps a little more closer to that perfect union the founders envisioned. I can only hope that this generation of students at Michigan State and the generation of my grandson Jack will complete the journey. And I thank you all for coming tonight let me talk to you about it. Thank you very much.